Thank you for coming today. Today I'll be speaking about ZODB, the graph database for Python developers. So recently, graph databases have become quite hot in the market. Let's take a look at five of the leaders. Uh, Neo4j, they got 80 million. Um, several others. MarkLogic got 150 million in venture capital. These are primarily Java-based graph databases. And the, the problem is Java is statically bound. It's not as flexible as Python. Um, it's, you get a huge impedance mismatch if you're a Python developer using a database written in Java. And in particular, because of their static nature, they tend to support one data type. For example, Neo4j does um, property graphs. Maybe they support several data types. But when you go with something like the ZODB, which gives you persistent Python, any Python data structure you want to do is really quite easy. There was an excellent talk this morning about GraphQL. And I was like, yeah, we can do GraphQL in ZODB. It's really easy. It's very flexible. It's Python. There's a reason people prefer Python. Um, OK, so the first pe question people ask is, well, is anybody using the ZODB? Uh, yeah, there's a very active community in the Plone world. Um, so just the government of Brazil has 100 different websites using Plone, everywhere from the, from the president's office, the, the parliament, lots of government offices. Uh, a lot of multilingual websites in Europe use Plone and the ZODB. So it's, it's very solid. It's very mature. There's a lot of people who care about it working correctly. When should you use it? Well, clearly, if you're doing a social network, you want to do a graph database. Um, I was talking to a person this morning about doing a network security application. You're doing a computer network. Obviously, you want to use a graph database. How do you not use a graph database? I, I don't understand. The Panama Papers was done using a graph database because you have all the different businesses and the people and the connections between them. You want to analyze what the relationships are. Um, that was all done doing a graph database, and the journalist said it was just so intuitive to use. Six of the 10 largest banks use MarkLogic um, and, and a lot of uh, credit card fraud analysis. I think the big application error is going to be natural language processing. On the left-hand side, you have a parse tree from NLTK. It does a lovely job parsing English. But that's one sentence. As soon as you have a paragraph, you have multiple sentences, and they're all intertwined, and you really have a graph. So on the right-hand side, um, um, Graphicus was done on top of the ZODB. Uh, we'll come back to that later. But basically, it, it's very nice for natural language processing, I believe. And it's really easy to use. Um, here we have a tree leaf object. We have the initialize method, set the title. We have a render method. And all you have to do is you subclass off persistent objects. So you have persistent objects. You have persistent containers, one or two other persistent types. You subclass off of them. Your objects become persistent. Your graph of objects become persistent. Your application becomes persistent. Really easy. Um, so how do we use it? On the left-hand side, we can create a tree leaf object called um, a, a leaf. And we can say root dot, dot leaf is equal to this new leaf. But in practice, you want to create lots of objects, lots of account objects, lots of people objects, lots of company objects. And so um, what you do is you, you sort of use the dictionary methods. You create the objects, and then you add them to the root under that name. Of course, first you have to create the database. So you import the ZODB. Um, you have to create storage. So you could, there you can do file storage. You can store it in a relational database. There's memory storage. There's the newt DB. There are several different ways of storing it. So you create one of those. <clears throat> um, you create the database, you get a connection to it, you get the root object, you do some operations on it, and then you do transaction.commit. In practice, the frameworks do all of this for you, so I don't even see this code. It's all done for me. Very rarely see it. Um, it's all just Python. If you want to change, if you want to change the name of the, an object, you ask the root for that object, and you set the title to be some new name. If you want to do a simple query, um, you can iterate over a container. And you can say, for, for key and item, give me the, the key and give me the item.title. <clears throat> if you want to delete an object, you can do delete it very easily. Do a transaction save. 
So it's really just magical. I, I reach into the database, I pull out the root object, I traverse to some other object, I do some transactions on it, I save it, maybe I delete it from the root, I disconnect it, and it, it gets garbage collected. Really easy, very, it gives me the illusion that I'm operating on persistent Python objects. <clears throat> um, where is it? Oh, is it a graph database? So, so yes, it is a graph database. Imagine our tree object, we created two, two leafs under it, but we can also set leaf1.sibling is equal to leaf2, and we can set leaf2.sibling on the right-hand side. Leaf2.sibling is equal to leaf1, and suddenly we have a graph database. And this is a very simple example for a quick lecture. But you can do this with arbitrarily, arbitrary branches of the tree. You do the transaction, dot commit and everything just works. It's really gorgeous. <coughs> so again, back to the example, we've got a tree, we've got two leaves that each link to each other. You delete one, well they're both still around because you can access one through the other. You can go root, give me leaf one, give me uh, sibling. You delete both, you can't access them, they all get garbage collected. So it's persistence by reachability. It's a proper ACID database. Um, I won't go into that too much, I don't even think about it. The only thing is you have to realize it's an optimistic concurrency control database. So it keeps around versions of objects. So if you're doing any kind of content management, HTML, CSS, JavaScript editing, you have previous versions, excuse me. Very nice. <clears throat> and because you have historic versions, you can restore those versions. So all of these different tools, they have a view history, view restore. This is from Plone. They have the most gorgeous graphics. Um, they can even compare two different versions. <coughs> so what are the advantages? Well, first of all, you don't have, you just simplify it. You just have an object model. You get rid of your relational schema. You get rid of object relational mapping. Um, you get rid of, uh, <coughs> of um, it does garbage collection for you, referential integrity is cleaned up, but the most important thing is what it does to your head. I was talking to a person yesterday who's doing a graph database for Deutsche Bahn for uh, 40 million nodes, and his language is just different. I went to a, an excellent discussion on Git and sticking, um, developing on the, on the main branch, and afterwards, I realized just the way you think about problems is different. And so, so I'm literally developing on a graph of objects, and I'm thinking in terms of graphs. I'm thinking in terms of distributed graphs. It's literally a different language. It's differently, literally a different way of looking at problems. So, that, so the, the change in mindset is maybe the most valuable advantage. OK, so, um, so how do you access an object? So here we have a tree of objects. A tr typically you have a graph of objects, but you access them as a tree. You can cross, jump across the tree to, if there's a link like that. Um, so how do you access it? So, well, the URL tells you where you are. So if I want to get to the lower right, um, slash will take me to the root, slash software libraries will take me down one, right to the, one, one node to the right, slash libraries, slash database libraries takes me down two nodes to the right, and so on, I can go all the way down to the right. So you can traverse to an object. And what I did for my Python links directory, because you want to have a, a canonical URL, I gave every object a unique name, and then there's a second index from the root of the tree to the, um, to the particular object. So you can either traverse through multiple objects, or just from the root, a single name takes you directly to the object. So that also makes it a graph database. And of course, you ha want to have views on these objects. So in a traditional Unix system, you have applications and you have files. But in the ZODB, you have objects, a graph of objects and views on those objects. And typically, what you're most concerned about is CRUD. So in a relational database world, we have create, read, update, and delete. But in a graph database, you, you navigate to the object by traversal so you can change the name of the object. So that's the rename. And you can take any object or any branch of the tree and you can copy and paste it, or you can cut and paste it. And then you also have this historic property that you can view historic versions and restore them. 
So there's CRUD, which you have in a relational database, but you also have extended CRUD. And if you go back to here, you have all of these CRUD are actually views, and the database knows which views can operate on which objects. So the question is, which views can operate on this tree leaf object? On the left-hand side, we have a tree leaf object, and the first line is at implementer. So we're saying the interface for this object is um, iTreeLeaf. These interfaces are very similar to Java interfaces. I'm not an expert on Java, but I believe the Java gives you the signature and it gives you the name of the attribute, whereas here, they're much richer. You can actually pop up forms using the interface. On the right-hand side, we can see the interface. <coughs> a more detailed description of the attributes. Take a look at the second one body gives you the title and whether it's required. There's a, the schema stuff gives you, a, it's a rich library of different types and, and options. So by saying iTreeLeaf, by saying that this object implements this interface, you get the basic CRUD, right? Because you need the meta information for create, read, and update. <clears throat> but a real world application is much more complex than that. You do not want to add stuff to the leaves and you do not want to delete the root. That would like make no sense. You don't want to rename the root. And you don't want to add account objects over here and you want to add customer objects over there. And so um, here again we have the tree leaf and if you look and the, and the interface on the right hand side, I displayable and I editable, what we're saying is that you can, you, that this tree leaf object can support the CRUD operations of I display and I edit. And in general, on the left hand side you have all of your different um, CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, rename, cut, copy, paste, um, history, and restore. And on the right-hand side, you have the interface. So the libraries give you um, iLeaf, which gives you all the, right, all the right interfaces for a leaf object, iContainer, all the right interfaces for a container object, iRoot for the root object, iImmutable, and you can customize them if you want to. Okay, so that's the basic object model. Let me talk about the distributed stuff. Um, also, if you're interested in following, I have a mailing list, so what I'll do is I'll ask you to pass around uh, the sign up, and there are a couple things. If you're interested in speaking um, in Poland, there's a ton of meetups who would love to have you come and speak, so there's a couple options there to, to fill out. I'll pass those around, because it takes a while to fill out for. Yeah, okay, start at the top and pass it down. That sounds good. Um, Okay, so distributed. So that's the object model, but you also have to have a distributed model. Which objects do you have on which computer and on which um, process? So you have a bunch of web clients, and they all access through some gateway, and you distribute um, them to different processes, different Python processes. And then all of those Python processes, they all talk to a Zio server, which um, actually stores the data, and it shares the data out as appropriate. So different servers, application servers, will have different copies of the data. So looking just at the application servers and the Zio server, the Zio server has all the data. Each of the application servers has a cache of the data. And when a transaction comes in, it updates some of the data that invalidates all of those caches of that object. And those, those application servers that want a new version will then go and access, will then go and ask for the new version of those objects. So it does all your cache coherency for you, which is supposedly a huge problem in computer science. It just takes care of it for me. So how do we store this stuff? Um, there are a bunch of different types of storage. The simplest is file storage, where you store the data in multiple files on a single computer. Of course, you have blobs for your images, so you can store it in blobs also. And as to you scale up, you have Zio, you have this client server stuff. And so the Zio will store it in file storage and blobs, and the Zio clients will just access the Zio server for it. They have some caching too. You can do it in rel storage, where Oracle, MySQL, or PostgreSQL, you can store the data in. Or if you're going with PostgreSQL, you can use Newt, <coughs> which not only stores a copy of the data, but it also uses the PostgreSQL indexes, which are very high performance, very well engineered. So there are lots of different ways. Actually, there's memory storage, and maybe a couple other ways of storage. Um, speed, read speed, it'll do, it's caches, it'll read, you know, you can do as much reads as you want. Great for web applications. For writes, it's limited to about thousands of transactions per second. You know, if my websites get thousands of transactions per second, I'm a, a very, very happy man. That's a problem I want to have. Um, scalability, uh, in production, they've had hundreds of 
uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data that's in the main files. In um, blob storage on Amazon S3, they've had terabytes. If that's not enough data for you, if you really need multiple servers to store your data, there's a cousin software called Neo, not Neo 4J, Neo, and that'll store 80 terabytes in production, 160 terabytes in testing, and by now it's probably higher. They've been working on pushing that up. Security, so the encryption, the Zeo clients to servers are, are encrypted. And the, one of the magical pieces of software is zero DB. So like in Microsoft, you have to store everything in the cloud, and then God knows we're talking about privacy. Who's reading that? So what zero DB did is they encrypt everything and decrypt everything on the client side. Even the indexes, they encrypt and decrypt on the client. So the server has no idea what the data is. Very nice piece of software. You can get it on GitHub. Kind of fun. Okay, so how does the ZODB compare to relational databases? Presumably you're all familiar with relational databases. Um, the concept of a tree or a graph, okay, you probably, that probably makes sense. And so there's some things that are very easy for me. I have about 10 different classes, and if I had, um, did it on a relational database, I'd have 10 different tables. And so to see which objects are in a particular node, I'd have to do a, a join across 10 different tables, which have very slow performance. And the ZODB, I just iterate over the node, and I go over the, over the children, and I do whatever operation I want for them. Really easy. Of course, in relational databases, indexes, um, for example, if you want to find the areas of leaf, um, it's very easy to create an index in a relational database on the area of leaf or some other value. And the ZODB, you have to create those indexes yourself. So everybody's got strengths and weaknesses. Mm -mm. OK, here's Graphagus. I love this. Um, the ZODB is a graph database in the sense that it st stores Python objects and it stores links to other Python objects. Neo4j is what's called a property graph database, where actually the links also have properties. And so somebody wrote in Graphicus 500 lines of code, get it on GitHub, uh, GPL. And what that does, it actually makes, graphic, it makes the ZODB look like a property graph database. And actually, two or three years ago, its performance was better for 500 lines of code than... than um, Node, but then, but then Neo4j, but then they got $80 million, so who knows what the current test results are. And on the right-hand side, you can also just represent this as a text. You can imagine reading the text in and generating the property graph database. So I think that this, you know, if there's anybody here who's interested in natural language processing, I'd love to talk to you. Okay, so on with the demo. Um, I'm not going to show you all the demo, because that's kind of boring. Okay, it works. 18 minutes, we're doing good. Um, but I do want to show you the history piece, because that's kind of fun. So I did, putting up a new website, sorry, that's not what I wanted. Putting up a new website, and, um, and I asked the marketing, this marketing guy to write some marketing piece for me. So here's what he did. Did I get this right? That's wrong. Let's do this one. It's reloading it, sorry. One. Slow network visit. Oh, it's two. One second here. One seventeen. No. Sorry. One. Two. There we go. Okay. So I asked this guy to do a marketing piece for me. Let's see what he wrote. So this is this this is Zopachi, which I haven't released yet, which is a web based. And so here is the. Um, the text that he wrote, so Apache, the world's only, graph-based, very nice. But I didn't like that. So let's, what we're doing is we're looking at the history, and here you can see, um, so actually we're making, using the WYSIWYG editor, grab a copy of this stuff. We're looking at the history view, and here you can see all the different versions, and I think this old version is the one I wrote, so click, yeah, that's the one I wrote that I like. We'll go back, and so we'll hit restore. Sorry, that's not where it's supposed to be. Hit restore. Okay, and now when we go to edit it, so you go back to the CK. This is the version I wrote. And we can just copy and paste his version in. So it's really nice if you're doing any kind of application, uh, any kind of text editing or content editing, to be able to go back to historic versions. Way easier than using Git. A lot of people just are clueless about Git. OK, so let's go back to the presentation. That's the, just a quick piece of the demo. And then the, the magical thing that I'm doing, this is Zopachi, is you can imagine that you have a tree of objects. And each of those has a class. And so there's a tree of Python classes. But I, as an end user, I can't add a file or an image to a Python object. It's way too hard. So what I do is I have a, a, 
a tree of containers. Uh, these are web classes. And then it's really easy to add a web, an image, or an HTML fragment. So when I do my, my applications and I have um, maps, you can see the maps on the boards outside, uh, maps on countries and cities and links and GitHub repositories and YouTube and, and uh, Facebook and, and all kinds of different web types, links to different pages, they all are slightly different. And I use these web classes, so it's very easy to edit the HTML, the CSS through the web. Um, just, and I'm sort of very proud of this, and most people don't think this way. But anyhow. Okay, so um, I have time for questions. I think we have quite a time. Hopefully there are lots of questions. Oh, and you get a, you get a chocolate. So if you, if you question and you're, and you're willing to say that that's your question, then we have chocolates for you. So you encourage people. It has to be a good question. So I go ahead. What are the we'll questions? Do if, if multiple people raise their hands, this is, this is anonymous. Yeah, exactly. And 10 people say, this is my I have question. multiple chocolates, so <laughs> I can tolerate a little dishonesty. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Do you have the identity of the person who wrote the chocolate the question? <laughs> uh, well, if they wrote their name. Yeah, we'll exactly. You have to say where you're sitting or something. But anyhow, go ahead. <laughs> OK. Uh, the, the question with the most upvotes was the following. How is the data physically stored? I think you touched on that Excellent one. Excellent question. And how does the scale to multi-gigabyte databases and, um, uh, and many application instances? Yeah, so they've, they've hundreds of gigabytes. They've done that in production, no problem. Um, if, you, if you need terabytes, then a Neo, not Neo4j, but Neo, has done 80 terabytes in production and 100, 160 terabytes in test. Um, how is it stored? Um, when you, so you have file storage, right? And so when you commit a transaction, there are a whole bunch of objects you've edited. And so it takes all of those objects, it puts it in a blob, and it puts it on the file system. So if you have a single file, you can imagine a long file where there's a series of transactions written to it, and you have an index that tells you where the most recent version of an object is. So what the magic they've done now, because that was limited to writing to a single file, but what they've done now using the techniques from Neo is they now have multiple files, and so they write that to the end of multiple files, and they sort of do that transaction stuff correctly. I have no idea how they do it. So that's how it's stored. Um, and so you have to do garbage collection, right? Because you get lots of versions of objects. And so in the, in the Zio example, you have, um, what you do is you have one of your Zio clients, it does all the garbage collection, it compresses it all, and then it switches that and you, and, um, you know, the rest of your application doesn't even know the garbage collection's happening. Thank you, good. Yeah. So two, this was how many by people anonymous, asked that question? So I don't know who asked it. Yeah. Who, 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 who answered those questions? We can, we can give out two or three chocolates for that one. I should have had a slide on that, it was my fault. <laughs> Okay. Okay, uh, next question. The next question was asked by someone who signed their name as J. So whoever that was. There you go. They have to show uh, the ID now, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So think of Break the largest the chocolate in half. <laughs> think of the largest ZODB uh, oh sorry. Largest ZODB graph you know. How many nodes and edges does it have? And are the graphs typically forests? Oh, are they trees? So um mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the thing to do is ask Jim Fulton, because he's the guy who, who wrote the database, and he's the guy who had hundreds of gigabytes. I don't know how many objects he had in there. Um, I don't think the number of objects, are, so that's, a, so he had, so what he said is hundreds of gigabytes and terabytes of Amazon S3, and they did the Amazon S3 stuff. They would save it locally, and they'd refer to it locally, and they'd push it out to Amazon S4, S3, and then when it was done, they would update the link, so it would actually link to this Amazon. But how many objects, no idea. Um, and also, if this question. mysterious person signed the J, you would like to person. Chocolate. <laughs> okay, whoever that was, please come forward. Uh, the next question was asked by, by Freedex. Uh, what are the advantages of using ZODB over, over other graph databases, such as Janus Graph? I don't know if I pronounced yeah. it correctly. So, one of the graph databases is done in Lisp, and you could do that. Um, but the uh, but the most of them are done in Java, and Java is a statically bound language. So one of the things I do sometimes is I will add an instance variable to an object, or I'll add an instance variable to a few objects at runtime. I, I'm not a Java expert, but my belief is in a statically bound language, you can't do that. You have to redefine that particular class. Um, and and the, it has to do with pickle. So what pickle is is a Python module that'll take sort of any subgraph of objects and it'll store it out to a data, to a, a single pickle. And so there are some objects which are persistent ZODB objects, and they have an ID. And so when it stores a pickle, it sees which ones are the persistent objects, and it stores some reference to them. And when it pulls them back in, it, it actually 
stores the ref pulls back in the reference to that other ZODB object. So you know, if you're a Python developer, you know, do you want to be using a ZODB? Actually, I did some. I I dug into it and I did some pretty interesting stuff modifying the libraries themselves. And I can do that because it's all Python. It's easy, right? I mean, why would you want? Anyhow, just obvious it should be in Python, isn't it? Anyhow. <laughs> There's one question about the internals. Uh huh. And um, how is con concurrent access or updates handled under, under, under the hood? Concurrent access. Um, so there's concurrent read and there's concurrent write. Okay. And so concurrent read is no problem, right? So it'll do that as well as as well as you can. Concurrent write is the problem. So it's an optimistic concurrency control database. So to a first approximation, it assumes that you're not going to have conflicts on, on writes, and if you do, there's going to be a problem. Uh, there are a lot of ways that it's improved. For example, say I have a container, and it's got lots of different objects. I can add something to it, and you can add something to it at the same time, and that just works very nicely. In fact, it even updates the count of objects, and that count of objects updates. Because if, if I've added one to the count, and you've added one to the count, we know that we just add two, and then we got the count correct. So that kind of conflict can be done. Um, if you have a problem where I'm editing my name and you're editing my name, um, then you're, you know, you're going to have some, you're going to have a conflict. It's not like, it's not like locking an airline reservation. But in practice, you know, that's just not a problem for the kind of web content applications that, that I've touched on that I've done a lot. But if you, if you are doing an airline reservation application, that's not what you want to do. You need a hard lock. You can't go with it. You don't want to go with the optimistic concurrency control database. Another one by, by Good Freedex. questions, though. Thank you. <laughs> Another one by Freedex. Is there support for Gremlin query qu 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 language? Gremlin. Yeah, I was just reading about Gremlin the other day, but um, I don't know enough about Gremlin. Uh, the GraphQL was this morning. It was a great lecture, and it totally made sense to me. And so um, there's this interface stuff, actually Zopdown interface stuff, that defines schemas. And one of the things you want to do is you want to say, uh, for GraphQL, you want to say this person has this permission to access it. So, so the whole schema definition piece is there. It's really easy to tie into GraphQL. It's probably what I need to be doing next. I was surprised he didn't get more questions. The, the software looks really interesting. I'm sorry, I don't know enough about Gremlin to answer that. So no chocolate for that guy. <laughs> because I, that's an embarrassing question, right? <laughs> oh, that, that one should be easy to Google anyway. So um, how does an application using ZODB compare in performance, mainly considering DB access latencies, to equivalent solutions using no SQL or SQL databases? So performance question. Yeah, so, the, so, um, so, so let's give you an example. Say you're doing sensor data collection, right? So you're getting all this data, and sometimes the data arrives and it doesn't, some, and then you just want to save it to a database, right? And you're not really doing transactions across multiple objects. So if you're just doing sensor data collection, then you, you don't want to use this because it's got transactions and, and that slows you down. Um, if you're doing like a relational database and you just are writing a record, um, the relational database will be faster. It's totally optimized for that than this. On the other hand, if you're writing 10 different records and you're, you have to access 10 different tables, this writes all the objects to the end of a file. It'll be way faster. Um, how's that for a couple examples? Does that if you go to the children and so on, are cycles or loops possible? How do you deal with them? If you go to what? Uh, to, to children and so on, if you just traverse downward, are cycles or loops possible? Yeah, uh, so there's some code in there that checks if you don't, if you go, so yeah, you can certainly screw something up and do a loop. So I remember there's one piece of code that checks if it, if it does 9,000, uh, if it does more than 1,000 times, it stops. Um, Uh, and one of the things that Python is great, it has all these error checks in it, right? And so it's important to have error checks in your software. So, so, so you can make mistakes, yes. OK. So we need to check it on the software level. That's yeah, the library should do that for okay. you. Libraries are pretty good for the testing mm -hmm. for the error checks. What type of applications are best handled by graph databases? Is it used in the, well, you already answered if it's used in, the pr in production. So what types of applications? So, um, so I'm a big believer in modeling the real world, OK? If you have a social network where the relationships are, are critical, then that should be a graph database. If you have a, 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 if you have a um, networking application where you look at the real world and it's a network, that's a graph database. If you have, a, um, I don't know, just a list of customers, then just use a relational table. So uh, I, actually, I think it has a lot to do with complexity. You get rid of the 
relational database, you get rid of the object relational mapper, you just have an object model, you can handle more complexity than you could before. So, so my theory is very complex, and this benefits most from very complex applications. And the final one, can the edges be weighed? Can the edges? Be weighed. Um, right there. Um. Wade. Maybe who asked the question oh. uh, would like to clarify? So we can graph this way when the edge uh, has some assigned value, which for example determines how short a path between the nodes is. And could you repeat the question for, for yeah, the yeah. recording? So, uh, uh, oh, okay. Um, can you repeat the question for the recording? Oh, can the edges can the edges be weighed? And so, so for example, can you have a weight to each edge? so that maybe the number of traversals is required or, or some color to each edge. Can the edges have properties is really. So there's a difference between the sort of traditional use of the ZODB where it's a, a graph of Python objects versus um, Neo4j, which is a property graph. And so Neo4j and Graphicus also has the same thing, is every edge is actually an object. And because every edge is an object, you can add attributes to that objects, weight, color, other information, um, methods, whatever. So, uh, so again, I guess there are two different ways of thinking of it. If you want to think of your edges as objects, go ahead and do it. It's, Graphicus was 500 lines of code, quite easy to do. Um, if you think sort of more as a Python developer and your, your objects are objects, so, so it's very flexible. It's Python, it's, it's do what you want, it's not Java. <laughs> what a fantastic, I, <laughs> what a fantastic I, I hope that was. I hope that was not a violation of the code of conduct <laughs> by criticizing Java. I hope I'm not in trouble. <laughs> the committee will decide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you.